It's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Robert Myers in the QASTM uh, talk. This is the 28th QASTM talk. So I don't need to give a broad introduction to the speaker. He's presently uh, uh, at Perimeter. He's the director of Perimeter at present and uh, also associated with uh, the University of Waterloo. And uh, his uh, expertise area is in quantum field strings, quantum gravity, and uh, also like uh, many questions related to black holes, quantum information theory, uh, these things he works on. Uh, today he is going to speak about a very interesting subject, which is at present people are working on and different perspectives. So he will talk about quantum extremal island made, made easy. Thank you, uh, Rob, for uh, your time and uh, uh, giving your consent to give this talk for this forum. Yeah, you can start. Okay, thank you very much. Um... So, well, here's the title, as was said, Quantum Extremal Islands Made Easy. Um, what I'd like to do is try and, and uh, let you know about some of the exciting developments that have been happening in the past year uh, having to do with the black hole information paradox. And in fact, I, I'd like to sort of uh, put it all in a setting where it perhaps may look more familiar to some of you. And this is work that I've been doing with these people here down at the bottom of the screen. Vincent Chen, Dominic Neumannfeld, Ignacio Reyes, who's actually at the AEI, and Josh Sandor. Uh, and we had a paper out uh, last month, and we hope to get another one out in the, in the coming uh, uh, month in August. Um, but I, uh, I'm expecting that this is a diverse audience, and so I wasn't really sure where to start, but I thought I would start uh, with some introduction, introductory material, uh, where I'll talk about these topics listed here, black hole entropy, entanglement entropy, holographic entanglement entropy. And that really sets a foundation for the, the what's, to me, of more interest, or the core of the talk which is these new developments about the information paradox. And the key player there is something called quantum extremal surfaces. And so in the second part of the talk, I'm really just reviewing material that's, uh, well, it, it, it was really, I'll be looking at the papers that sort of kicked off this whole new program of research, and that's about a year old now. Um, but then in the third part, what I'm going to do is I'm going to recast all of that in a, in a slightly different setting, which may be more familiar to some of you, but it allows us to think about these problems uh, in higher dimensions, whereas the original work was done very specifically for simple two-dimensional theories of gravity. And then in the last section, I'll just talk a little bit uh, about the new insights that you get. Um, when you recast uh, the, the work in this new setting. Okay, so let's get started then with the first uh, section, the introduction, and there I'll kick off with black hole entropy. So this was actually a remarkable discovery um, almost 30 years ago, or 40 years, no, it's, oh my goodness, it's almost 50 years old now. Jacob Beckenstein, when he was still a grad student, uh, made started thinking about black holes and in fact information theory and and he came to the conclusion that black holes have entropy and this was really a breakthrough at the time black holes were you know these elegant solutions of Einstein's equations and they were really uh, you know a playground for uh, you know mathematical physics but they weren't really um, thought about in well certainly in the context of information theory but in the context of even astrophysics or cosmology and so well this wasn't quite his formula but what he showed what or what he argued for was that the entropy of a black hole should be proportional to the area of the horizon now implicitly that says that there are all sorts of hidden states there 
And so there was a lot of back reaction. There was a lot of resistance to this idea. But of course, that melted away within a couple of years because what happened is that Stephen Hawking independently showed that when I take into account quantum fluctuations of fields in a black hole background, that the black holes actually emit radiation and it's radiation that looks almost like black body radiation with a very specific temperature. And that temperature is governed by something known as the surface gravity, or it's a canonical acceleration that's associated with the black hole horizon. And with that idea, then it was natural, since there's a temperature, that there should be an entropy. And in fact, using this formula here, one was able to get a very precise coefficient uh, of proportionality between the entropy and the horizon area. And it's given by these uh, natural constants or constants of nature. And in fact, then that formula became in the subsequent uh, years sort of a watering hole for many different uh, kinds of physicists, theoretical physicists to try and understand. And, and one of the reasons is it contains so many interesting elements of physics. There's the C cubed here, or the speed of light from relativity. There's Boltzmann's constant from thermal physics or thermodynamics. There's an H bar from quantum theory. And there's, of course, this being a, a gravitational phenomena or, or black holes being a gravitational phenomena. There's a Newton's constant here that indicates it's, it's uh, a gravitational effect. And so you're bringing together all sorts of different physics here. And in particular, what you see is quantum and gravity coming together in a very intriguing way. And so this was often seen as a window or a potential window into the nature of quanta, a quantum theory of gravity. Now, if as particle physicists do, we set h bar and c to one, then the formula takes a simple form like this. It's almost the four uh, area over 4G that we recognize, but there's actually, we have to keep into account, there's a Boltzmann's constant sitting here in front. And what that reminds us is that entropy, as it was originally discovered, or originally constructed, uh, was in thermodynamics, and it was associated with heat losses or work losses or inefficiencies in various processes or limits on efficiency. And it was in the context of thermodynamics that people actually originally described black holes and black hole entropy. It was thinking about processes where you're dropping masses into a black hole or where you're extracting spin energy um, and the limitations on those processes. But of course, in statistical mechanics, there's also in, in ordinary quantum or ordinary uh, thermal systems, there's a relation between the entropy and the states that uh, go into the system that make up the thermal uh, system. And here I'm just writing von Neumann's formula for a given density matrix. I take minus trace rho log rho, and that gives me the entropy. And remarkably, it's the same quantity that one finds in thermodynamics. And so in this context, what this is hinting is that if black holes are more or less ordinary quant uh, thermal systems, then it's hinting that there's a whole raft of underlying microstates in the quantum theory that make up the black hole. And in fact, there's this remarkable connection. It's saying this information about the microstates is encoded in the uh, geometry of the space-time of the black hole. One of the features that is unusual about this formula is that usually in thermodynamics, we think of entropy as an extensive quantity. And certainly here, the black hole entropy or the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy is not extensive. It grows like an area rather than the volume. And so that was a curiosity or a puzzle for a long time, but it was originally um, Raphael Sorkin, who made another breakthrough in that he was the first person, and it's just another real breakthrough, he made the suggestion that I should think, or that one should think of black hole entropy as an entanglement entropy. And so at this point, I have to take a step back to try and explain what the intention there was. 
And so we'll go back to quantum theory and the idea of quantum entanglement. Now, this is a big set of words, but what it really means is that I can, the, in a quantum system or in quantum theory, I describe systems with many different parts, but ultimately I describe them with a single wave function. And so given that single quantity that describes all of the different subsystems together, there can be uh, correlations between the different subsystems that we wouldn't otherwise uh, understand. And so, of course, the, the classic example is the EPR experiment, where they imagined a, a certain creation of a certain state of photons. The photons travel off in opposite directions. But no matter how far apart they travel, one finds when uh, Alice and Bob make their measurements of the polarization that those measurements are correlated. And that was uh, a, an example of this quantum entanglement. Of course, they called it, uh, they gave it a fancy uh, name and they, they thought of it as a spooky action at a distance. Um, originally, when they put this forth, they saw this as a flaw in quantum theory, and they were trying to argue for a more fundamental underlying uh, set of physics. But now we've come to understand that this is really, quantum entanglement is really the thing that distinguishes the quantum world from the classical world. And so we've developed whole new fields like uh, quantum information, where entanglement now becomes a resource becomes a resource for uh, ultra-fast communication or ultra-fast computations, ultra-secure uh, communications. It's also entered the understanding of new systems in condensed matter theory. In particular, the entanglement, quantum entanglement is seen as the key to various exotic or what are seen as exotic phases, exotic phenomena such as quantum Hall fluids, unconventional superconductors, spin fluids. And what we've been learning in the past decade is that uh, quantum entanglement is really also an important property um, that can play a role in our understanding of quantum field theory and also, in fact, quantum gravity. Now, I just want to go back. We had this simple wave function for the EPR experiment. One might think that by making the wave function more complicated, as I've done in these two examples down here, we're going to make a state that's more entangled. But in fact, if we look at this second state, the psi prime, and we fool around with it a little bit, what we find is that's actually a product state. And in fact, the spin of one photon and the, or the polarization of one photon and the other photon aren't related at all and the measurements would be completely independent. On the other hand, in this third example, all I've done is I flip the sign here, but I end up with a state that is uh, entangled. There's no way to get this kind of uh, product uh, structure in anymore after flipping that sign. Now, it's easy when I have two degrees of freedom to sit down and fool around with the uh, wave function and decide, yes, this is an entangled state. This is not an entangled state. But we're talking about systems that have many degrees of freedom. We're talking about things like quantum gravity or quantum field theory. And so what we would like is some kind of systematic measure of entanglement, something that we can, a diagnostic or a diagnostic that can say this wave function or this system is entangled, this system is not entangled, and perhaps to give us a measure of how much entanglement there actually is. So the way that's done, of course, or the proposal, what we now understand as entanglement entropy is what we're going to do is we're going to use that von Neumann formula or we're going to use an uh, entropy formula as a diagnostic for the entanglement. And the key idea is we take our system, our quantum system, and we just divide it in two. That's an arbitrary choice, but now we have an A and a B. And what we'll do is we'll trace over the degrees of freedom in uh, the subsystem B. The remaining degrees of freedom in subsystem A are now described by a density matrix. 
And that density matrix is what we plug into uh, the von Neumann formula to end up with an entropy. And in this particular case, with this construction, that's called the entanglement entropy. So let's look at our EPR wave function here. What we might do is we might trace over one of the spins, or the natural division is between the two uh, photons. We'll trace over one of the spins that leaves us with a density matrix that takes this form here. And when I apply von Neumann's formula, what I get is an entanglement entropy of log two. So um, I'm log using a natural function. log, so it's it's uh, log two. Sorry, was there a question? Yeah. So like uh, in the second case where you are getting log two, if you generalize this thing for n number of spins, uh, ma 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 the mixed kind of thing, then how to uh, uh, is that will be uh, log two some to the power n or something like that? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I can in, I can have a wave function here with any number of spins. Okay. I can make an arbitrary division between those. Uh, you know, if if I had a spin chain, I can just make an arbitrary division and say, well, we'll keep this set of spins and and trace out these uh -huh. um, to get a more complicated density matrix here. In general. Um, I don't think I would get an integer times log two, okay. but the truth is this morning, I'm not exactly sure. I'm not used to thinking of it that way. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm used to thinking that what comes out is a real number, but I, I, I'm not, uh, I have to confess that I'm not sure about that last answer. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. In, in any event, if you apply that same procedure down here, you'll see in the second case, the state that I said was not entangled, the entanglement entropy is actually zero. Um, and so that's indicating that our diagnostic works. Um, and in the second case where we, we uh, found again that it was an entangled state, you'll find that in this particular case, tracing out one of the degrees of freedom gives you a log two worth of entropy. So again, that's a very general procedure. I'm applying it to this simple system with two polarizations, two, two spins. Um, but we want to think about systems with many degrees of freedom. In particular, we'd like to think about quantum field theory. And so what am I going to do in that case? Well, the first thing we do is we pick a constant time slice, and we take the field configurations on that constant time slice as a an indicator of the space of states that are available to us in the quantum field theory. And so what we'll do is we'll introduce an entangling surface or on the, the constant time surface, we'll make an arbitrary division between, well here I'll call it an inside and an outside. Um, this is what we call A and this is what we called B before, or here I'm calling it A complement. And so now I've got two separate regions on my time slice. I integrate out the degrees of freedom on the outside or in the A complement. That gives me a density matrix for the degrees of freedom in this region A, and I do the same calculation of trace rho log rho. Now there's a small problem though in quantum field theory. I know what the answer is gonna be before I even do the question or do the calculation. And in fact, in this particular case, the answer is going to be infinite. And that's because the, the entanglement entropy is actually UV divergent. The reason being is that there is entanglement down to arbitrarily small scales. And so what happens is that the entropy, this quantity here is dominated by the short wavelength correlations in the vicinity of this entanglement surface. And to make sense of that, what I have to do is I have to introduce a UV cutoff or a short distance cutoff and basically ignore uh, any correlations or excitations at shorter wavelengths. And so here I've introduced uh, a short distance cutoff delta. And what it turns out is the entropy is organized in terms of the ratio of some macroscopic scale that I've called R here that characterizes the size of the region um, and then there are various powers but I think there's a question 
Sorry, is there a question about the entanglement entropy? Um, oh. I just want to ask one thing that this R by delta, delta you are saying that some cutoff, a short distance cutoff, yeah. this R by delta is larger than one or smaller than one? Uh, delta, you should think of that as a tiny scale. It's a UV cutoff. Okay. R, you should think of as a macroscopic scale that's characterizing the size of my region A. Okay, okay. So, so that's, a, that's an infrared scale. That's an ultraviolet scale. So that ratio is large. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and so the largest term here goes like uh, the space-time dimension minus two. Uh, that ratio to that power, but then you'll also find that there are subleading powers as well. So here, uh, the main job is to determine these coefficients. Uh, well, that would be the main co uh, job, but one of the things you'll find is that um, this is a power law divergence. Okay. And so this is not a, it, it has a very elegant form that I haven't completely explained yet, but this coefficient then is, is uh, not universal. It depends on the choice, the specific choices that you make for the regulator. Okay. Now in special cases, what you'll find down here in the dot, dot, dot is that in special cases, it'll be a term that involves a logarithm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in that case, the coefficient of the logarithm will in fact be a universal term. So here I've written D minus four. We live in four dimensions. And so in D equals four, what you find is that there's this term that goes like R over delta squared. And this term is actually a logarithm rather than a constant. Yeah. And in that case, the coefficient here actually is a universal coefficient that's telling you about the properties of the underlying quantum field theory. So it, it, uh, this thing actually depend on dimension also, like in which- it, Yeah, if I, if I, I'm a string theorist, so I think about theories in all different kinds of dimensions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True. If, if I was thinking about, say, a two-dimensional theory, in fact, the leading term would be a logarithm. Sure. If I think about a theory in uh, three dimensions, in fact, this would be, you know, R um, over delta and the next term, well, there, there wouldn't be uh, another divergent term. There'd be just small corrections after that. Sure. But one of the things I wanted to add is I picked, you know, this entangling surface to have a funny shape here. And, and that was an arbitrary choice that I can make. One might, think about doing the same calculation but for many different shapes um, and in fact r the, the quantity that characterizes those shapes would be changing and you'd find actually that there's a, a geometric interpretation of the terms that that is uh well it, it's characterized here but but it has a nice geometric interpretation so in fact this first term instead of just having a, a length scale to some power, it would actually be, I could think of it as the area of this entangling surface, the area of this blue surface, divided by the cutoff to the appropriate power to make this dimensionless. So again, if we're in D equals four, the blue surface um, is actually a co-dimension two surface. And so it really is like a sphere or, or some, some surface with area, and I would have a power delta squared underneath. If I was in, uh, you know, three dimensions, then this line or, or the, the surface really would just be a line. And even though I'm calling it an area, what it would really be is it would be the length of that line sigma. And in higher dimensions, you know, in five dimensions, even though I call it an area, it would be a volume. And then I'm running out of words when I go to higher dimensions. But one of the other interesting things is that the subleading terms, again, it's, it's characterizing uh, the entangling surface, but now it would be involving something like the integral of a curvature of the surface over that surface. 
and then there'd be a lower power because the curvature has dimensions and decreases the, the engineering dimension of the numerator here, there's a lower power that's uh, needed uh, for the cutoff to make that a dimensionless contribution. And again, in the case of the four dimensions, this, this combination would actually involve a logarithm. And what you would find here is by examining the different curvatures, you could, you could find different coefficients that ca characterize the underlying quantum field theory. So I'll just pause there and ask if there are any more questions about the entanglement entropy. If not, I will carry on, but the, the natural thing to observe here is that I have a quantity, it's an entropy, it was calculated with this von Neumann formula. It's not a thermal entropy, it has to do with the quantum fields and the quantum state of the system. But the key observation that uh, Raphael Sorkin made is that this leading term is not extensive like a thermal entropy. Instead, it goes like the area of this entangling surface. And so returning to the black hole, well, the horizon is natural a boundary that divides the inside and the outside. And so Raphael's suggestion was that the black hole entropy is actually an entanglement entropy between the degrees of freedom inside and the degrees of freedom outside. And in fact, you know, this formula, if this scale here or this power of delta looked like Newton's constant or was chosen near Newton's constant, that means that we'd be choosing this uv cutoff near the Planck scale, then in fact this formula would look very much like this formula up here for the black holes. And so that was a suggestion that he made actually uh, all the way back in 1984 and it was rediscovered by many people in subsequent years and developed. And it, it, it really was an intriguing idea. What um, some folks, uh, Lenny Susskind and John Uglum, uh, actually were able to argue is that, well, the calculation I'm doing has to do with quantum fields in a particular background. Um, and those quantum fields are making a contribution to the, uh, to the gravitational entropy or to the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy but it's only a particular contribution. And the real question comes down to, you know, how do you describe that microscopic uh, or the entropy of the microscopic or the quantum gravity degrees of freedom? And, and that's really a bit of a puzzle now, but it, I think the idea is more or less accepted that uh, the black hole entropy is related to an entanglement entropy. The challenge is though, and I'm not going to solve that problem for you today, but the challenge is to really fully understand how that entanglement uh, really uh, propagates down to scales of the order of the Planck scale or to the scales where quantum gravity becomes important. Of course, the black hole entropy was one part of a bigger story, as I said, Hawking showed that, that the black holes were behaving like thermal systems and they were emitting uh, radiation. And so that led to conundrums like that the radiation is carrying away uh, energy. And so eventually the black holes would evaporate. Um, that led to a problem called the information paradox. And I'll touch on that again later on in the talk. Um, but in trying to resolve that, um, these folks, Gerard Tuff and Lenny Susskind, started thinking about the importance of the horizon. And their suggestion was that there's a form of holography, that you can think about the black hole in terms of a theory that just lives on the horizon. So uh, 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 for a Black hole in four dimensions, the, if I cut a cross section of the horizon, that's two dimensional and that evolves in time. And they wanted to think that the, the, not just the information about how many microstates there were, but the dynamics of those microstates, how they evolve, 
could be described in terms of a dual theory or a, a holographic theory that lived on that uh, horizon. And it was holographic because, of course, I'm, I'm throwing away one of the dimensions, say, the interior of the black hole, and I'm just focusing on the surface that encloses that interior. Now, that's what I'm calling uh, holography version 1.0. That was an intriguing idea. People thought about it, but it wasn't really clear how to, how to come to grips with it, what the full implications were, how to calculate. And so where holography really took off was um, in 1997 when, um, uh, well, uh, Juan Maldacena made a very interesting observation and an audacious claim, which was uh, really the uh, ADS CFT correspondence. And what is that? Well, that's just really, I like to think of it as a dictionary between two different languages that describe the same uh, physical phenomena. So one of those languages is gravity with a negative cosmological constant, and the other language is the language of quantum field theory, albeit a quantum field theory without any intrinsic scale. And so those are special uh, field theories known as conformal field theories. The simplest solution of gravity, Einstein gravity with a negative cosmological constant, is called a uh, anti de Sitter space. And so that's the ADS, that's the CFT, and those are the initials then appearing in the correspondence. Again, this is a holographic uh, duality or a holographic dictionary in that the anti de Sitter space is D plus one dimensional. And there's a sense in which you can think that the conformal field theory lives on the boundary of that space. And so it has one dimension less. And so again, we're relating a theory, a gravitational theory in the bulk to a du dual theory on a boundary that encloses that bulk, just as we did with the black hole. Now, how does that relate uh, to the entanglement entropy? Well, something that happened uh, many years later that's very interesting is Ru and Takinagi brought together holography and entanglement entropy. And I was drawing a picture like this and describing calculations of entanglement entropy in quantum field theory. Well, in this particular case, we have a boundary conformal field theory, that's a quantum field theory. And so we could do a calculation or we could ask to do a calculation like this in that boundary conformal field theory. And so the question is, what's the entanglement entropy for this configuration? Um, but what I would like to do, or what they did, is they, they want to use a, the uh, duality to the gravitational theory to their advantage. And they want to understand, how do I answer this question in terms of the underlying or the equivalent gravitational theory? And of course, their answer was this. What I should do is, well, this picture now lives in the, at the boundary of the anti de Sitter space. And so in my cartoon, what lies under here is the bulk space time. And so what I'm supposed to consider are all of the bulk surfaces that extend down into the anti de Sitter space, but connect or reach the boundary along the entangling surface here. And then what I do is I evaluate on that surface this formula, A over 4G, which of course is the Bekenstein-Hawking formula. And then I'm supposed to extremize. I'm supposed to find the surface V that gives us the minimal answer for this quantity. And then the minimal answer is none other than the uh, entanglement entropy for this problem that I formulated in the boundary conformal field theory. So this is uh, the Bekenstein-Hawking formula. That's something that we know is related to entropy in the context of black hole. But here they're saying you can apply that formula in a completely different context. There are no horizons here. There are no black holes. Rather, what I'm thinking about is an extremal surface that extends through the anti de Sitter space-time. Now, that was a remarkable conjecture now over uh, 10 years ago, 14 years ago. Uh, 
Um, and it was followed by many consistency, detailed consistency tests. Essentially what it was is the uh, string theorists discovered a new property of entanglement entropy, and then they tried to apply it in this context. And they found that this formula gave a result that was consistent with that property. Um, and it wasn't actually until 2013 that these gentlemen here came up with a proof of this uh, formula here, this Rutaki Nagi prescription for bulk space times that were static. And then this uh, paper followed where they thought about um, more general space times and a more intricate uh, proof. So it took almost 10 years to get from the original conjecture to a proof that this is actually a correct uh, uh, prescription to calculate the entanglement entropy. But then in the subsequent time or, or during that time, what was found is that the holographic entanglement entropy um, became an interesting and a fruitful forum for a dialogue between the bulk and the boundary perspectives. And by that, I mean that using this formula, we knew, learned new lessons about quantum field theories, but at the same time, the, the learning went in the other direction and we learned new lessons about quantum gravity um, and the nature of the gravity theory and the bulk here. And so that in a uh, very lightning uh, pace, uh, uh, well, introduction is my introduction to those ideas, the black hole entropy, the entanglement entropy and holographic entropy. And so I'll just pause here again and I'll ask if there are any questions. If, if not, I, I can just carry on. So I'm, I'm not hearing any questions. We'll just carry on then. And we'll see what, what exciting things happened uh, in the last year or so. And so this goes back to the black hole information paradox. The idea is that I, here, this is a Penrose diagram of a black hole that forms and then evaporates due to the emission of Hawking radiation and disappears leaving just um, flat space time behind. Um, initially, I can start with my quantum fields um, in a pure state or in a particular quantum state. That state, but on the, in that state, the fields can still collapse and form the black hole. What I mentioned though was that the Hawking radiation looks like thermal radiation. And so this is something that's characterized by a mixed state. And so if the evaporation process uh, occurs or proceeds in the same way that uh, Hawking described, then we'll just end up with empty space here and a bunch of uh, thermal radiation uh, running off to infinity. And so what that means is that in this process, we've started with a pure quantum state, and we've gone to a mixed quantum state or something that's described by a particular wave function to something that had to be described by a uh, density matrix. And that violates the basic tenets of quantum theory. If I just evolve by Hamiltonian evolution, that's a unitary process and it should take a pure state to a pure state. And so there's a problem here. There's something that we don't understand and that's really the puzzle of the black hole information paradox. Now, how do I phrase this? What I was talking about were entropies. So how do I phrase this puzzle in terms of the entropy? Well, what I can do is I can think about the entropy of the radiation that's coming out here. And in Hawking's description, that's thermal radiation. Originally, there is no radiation out here. And so it slowly starts to leak out and the entropy of that radiation builds and builds just as I get more and more entropy or more and more radiation coming out. But eventually it caps off up here. The, the black hole eventually has disappeared and what I'm left with is just the, the radiation and its entropy is fixed. Um, and so that's the evaporation time. Now, that then is an indication that I've gone from zero entropy to a finite entropy. That's my evolution from a pure state 
to a mixed state. What Don Page uh, argued is that, well, if I, if I believe that this is a unitary process, then in fact, you know, at a certain point, about halfway through the evaporation process, this building buildup of the entropy should actually stop and it should start to turn down. And it's a very simple idea, which is that the, um, if I have a pure state, and this is an entanglement entropy, well, they, the entropy can't be any larger in one half than it can in the other. And so there's an upper limit here. The black hole is getting smaller and smaller in this process. And so at a certain point, half of the, the uh, black hole is gone. The, the entropy can't be any bigger than the entropy that's carried by the black hole. And in fact, it has to head down to zero when the black hole disappears. And so this curve, this red curve, or a curve like it where the entropy goes up, but then eventually comes down to zero, which reflects a process that would be unitary, um, is called the page curve. And so the puzzle is that the calculations we knew and understood gave this blue dotted curve, the Hawking curve, but most people or many people in the field believe that it should have been a unitary process. And so what we should have seen is this kind of red curve where the entropy went up for a while, but then it turned down and eventually made its way back to zero. And that's really what new insight has come is how to explain or how to understand this page curve. And this was really kicked off by two papers in the spring of last year. And then there was a third paper that also gave some important insights um, in August of last year. And so I'm gonna focus, well, subsequent to that, there are now lots and lots of uh, papers on the topic and people who have written about this. Um, and so this is just a partial list of some of the authors who are thinking about this idea, these ideas. But I want to focus on that uh, middle paper by Elmari, Engelhart, Marolf, and Maxfield. And they were uh, using a very simple model in two dimensions. And it was a holographic model. Um, but their bulk theory is a two-dimensional theory. Um, uh, it's a two-dimensional theory of gravity. And so what that means is that the boundary theory is actually one dimensional, or in, in other words, they have a quantum mechanical system associated with the boundary theory. And so in fact, what they're going to do is they're gonna have two of these quantum mechanical systems, and they're gonna put them in a thermofield double state. And what that means is that in the bulk here, what I end up with is a, an eternal black hole. Um, that describes the entanglement between the two sides of that geometry, of the bulk geometry, or the, between the two boundary theories. In their context, they were working with a very special kind of a gravity theory called JT gravity. And uh, they also wanted that matter, or that theory to be coupled to um, a two-dimensional uh, quantum field theory so that there were matter fields running around in the bulk as well. And then there's some other stuff here, but I just wanted to remind you or, or give you a little uh, primer. So two-dimensional gravity, I can't just use the Einstein-Hilbert term. The Einstein-Hilbert term is topological. Its variation just uh, vanishes if I'm working in two dimensions. And so they used what I call this JT gravity or Jaquie Teitelboim gravity, where one introduces an extra scalar field, namely the diliton. Oh, I misspelled it. This is the diliton. And um, so the gravity action, the key part of the gravity action is really right here. I've got my Einstein uh, or the Ricci scalar, but now I've got in front of it the diliton term or the scalar field. And so the equations of motion will be non trivial. In fact, the action is written in this way, where it's r minus the cosmological constant. So the equation of motion for the diliton is just that the Ricci scalar is a constant. On the other hand, when I vary the metric, I get a more complicated equation of motion for uh, the Ricci scalar. 
over here, I've just added the, the standard uh, Ritchie Scaler term or Einstein Hilbert term. This is now topological, but it plays a role in some parts of the calculation. Um, um, Rob, what is the uh, interpretation of phi naught? Is it the uh, boundary value? Well, it, it uh, no, this is not the boundary value. This is sort of, well, it, it has a meaning. Uh, for example, I can derive this um, uh, action um, by looking about looking at charged uh, black holes in higher dimensions, like say a four-dimensional uh, Reisner Nordstrom black hole. But then I would take the extremal limit and I would look at the gravitational physics in the vicinity of the horizon. And what you would find is an action that looks more or less like this. The role of the phi, or if I take phi naught plus phi, that would actually be the area of the horizon. Or in the vicinity of the horizon, what happens is, uh, in the vicinity of an extremal horizon, what happens is the geometry looks like a two sphere that was the two sphere enclosing the, the black hole and uh an anti de sitter space so this and is so what we're capturing here is the physics of that anti de sitter space the phi or the phi naught plus the phi is uh describing the fluctuations in the area of the the two sphere yeah. um, if you like the phi naught can be the canonical area associated with the extremal solution and the little phi here without the subscript is sort of describing the fluctuations around that canonical two sphere. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And uh, one more thing, uh, yeah. like only the JT gravity is the option to connect with uh, some known uh, one dimensional quantum mechanics. Well, the reason it, it, the reason it is thought of as holographic is actually an independent line of inquiry. Um, well, it's actually a very old uh, Satyev and Ye looked at this kind of model, but but Kataya showed in recent years that it actually is a holographic theory. There, the idea is to have a quantum mechanical system of uh, uh, just may well in the Kataev model, they're just Mayorana fermions yeah. that can evolve in time, but they can have these uh, random couplings yeah. uh, that connect the various fermions. Um, and what one does is this is actually an ensemble theory, so that um, rather than thinking about an individual theory with random couplings here, you you average over those couplings or you average over the theories where the average of the coupling squared takes some particular form here, depending on, you know, the number of indices in the interaction or the number of fermions in the interaction um, and the total number of fermions. And then this, this is a parameter that parameterizes the strength of the interaction. But in, in this particular context, what Kataev showed is there, uh, there is an emergent conformal symmetry and that there is a dual description in terms of a gravity theory and it's a gravity theory that looks like this uh, uh, well JT gravity and so that was the connection with holography that that people played with it's it's a somewhat unconventional it's not the conformal field theory that I described before but it is a, a very uh, interesting uh, set of theories that have all sorts of fascinating properties that have been. No, uh, particularly, I have asked this question for one more reason. Like, okay. uh, apart from SYK, people used to consider this Gurau Witten tensor models also. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, for the tensor models, can you find out some kind of gravity dual like that? Um, uh, the truth is, I'm not sure. I don't. I think it's been shown to be um, like I think at leading order those tensor models are equivalent to uh, the JT gravity, but I think at higher orders, like if I start to take into account one over n corrections, mm -hmm. um, I think the the two theories diverge. But actually, if they if they agree to leading order in one over n, 
or in the one over n expansion, I think at some level you should be able to see a duality like this. Okay. Okay. But part of today's talk is to show you that, you know, this was the starting point and, and it's a very special theory, but in fact, all of these ideas extend to the standard ADS CFT. And, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that I want to, uh, well, I'll be explaining in the next part of the talk. Okay. But I didn't want to proceed without telling you a little bit about uh, the background of what these uh, people were doing. And then a key feature is they didn't, uh, in, in the, uh, this paper for the, about the information paradox, they, just, they didn't want to just consider the gravity theory. They wanted to couple the gravity theory to a conformal field theory. So there is uh, a theory, a, a set of conformal fields running around in the background that's governed by this gravity theory. Um, I, I said that there was a black hole, um, but I also said that the geometry was just anti de Sitter space or two dimensional anti de Sitter space. So, how does that jive? Well, what it really is, you might think of it as a topological black hole or, or a, um, you might think of it as a Rindler horizon. I mean, what one does is one takes the metric on two dimensional anti de Sitter space and writes it in this particular coordinate system that function f vanishes and so it looks like there's a horizon here this is the form you know that we're used to for a black hole um, geometry but it's really um, a coordinate horizon like a rindler horizon that appears here um, in the geometry oops sorry the thing that distinguishes uh, this as a special place um, is actually the dilaton. Hi, Bob. Can I ask you a question here, please? Sure. Yep. Yeah. We can either consider it as a black hole, but we can also consider this is an extremal black hole in four dimension, right? Which also yep. describes an ADS space. Yeah. So it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily a two dimensional black hole, but we can consider a extremal limit yeah. of a Four-dimensional, four-dimensional extremal black hole. Is that okay? Right. okay. No, 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 that's fine. And and but but what you have in four dimensions is this these extra dimensions. And as I said, those extra dimensions, their role is sort of played by the dilaton. And so yeah. what I was saying is that well, this, you know, just looks like a Rindler horizon. What really makes this a special place, say this the middle of the X, is the behavior of the dilaton in this solution. And so the dilaton. Um, you know, has a particular value and then it grows on, on, on time slices as you head out towards the boundary in this direction or this direction and it, it actually decreases, oops, ah, it decreases as you head down here or down here. And, and, and those variations are characteristic of the geometry in four dimensions when, I, when I'm just above, say, extremality and I can see that there's a center, there, there really is a horizon uh, in the middle of my four dimensional black hole and, and uh, you know, how that geometry behaves. So what's key here is there is a fixed geometry, but it's really what, what makes this a special uh, horizon uh, is the behavior of the dilaton field, which is the thing that characterizes the higher dimensions. Uh, when I think of it, as, say, as a, a four-dimensional black hole up here. Thank you. Okay. Um, but let's go back to this picture here. So far, I talked about the quantum mechanical systems and their dual in terms of a gravity theory. Um, that's only part of the picture. There are also these lines. So traditionally, when we do holography, what we did is we uh, had an uh, anti de Sitter space, and there's a boundary, fields could propagate out to that boundary. And what we did is we imposed a reflecting boundary condition. So if they got out to the boundary, they would bounce back into the interior. And so what was new to both, well, it was both Pennington, but in particular this, is they said, well, let's actually couple the degrees of freedom at the boundary to something else. And that something else was just 
a two-dimensional conformal field theory living on a half line. Or, well, that's the spatial section is this half line and that propagates or evolves in time. And these degrees of freedom were chosen to be the same degrees of freedom that were propagating around in the gravity theory. And so now, if some kind of Hawking quanta was allowed to, uh, or was emitted by the black hole horizon, it would reach the boundary eventually. The CFT, so it's a massless degree of freedom, it can reach the boundary. But then what they did is they introduced a boundary condition that just, rather than reflecting it back in, it was allowed to leak out and it propagated out into this non-gravitational region, this region where there was just the CFT living on the half line. And so the language they used is that this was a bath. They, they didn't mean that there was a temperature there, but what they meant is there were a large number of degrees of freedom that could absorb the thermal radiation from our black hole. And with the radiation leaking out, that meant that the black hole could evaporate. And what they did is they uh, analyzed the behavior. Uh, so that's like the radiation escaping to infinity in my uh, information paradox. And eventually the black hole evaporates, it goes down to zero size, and there's a bunch of radiation out here. But then we run into the same kind of, potentially we'd run into the same kind of paradox that we would before. But they showed that when you use uh, quantum extremal surfaces and holographic entanglement entropy here, what you find is that um, there's a phase transition or there's a new saddle point. Um, and I'll describe that in more detail when we, we get to higher dimensions, but what they showed is that you could reproduce the page curve for this particular system here. But one of the keys was they were using the idea of quantum extremal surfaces. Remember when I talked about holog holographic entanglement entropy, there was an extremization or a minimization. And I talked about there being extremal surfaces. Now that I've added the word quantum here, which means that I've changed the rules a little bit. And they're using the rules that were put forward originally by these three authors, but then studied in more detail by Engelhardt and Wall. And so what's going on there? Well, if I wanted to uh, well, maybe we better look here. You know, what I said is that the um, in the uh, Rutakinagi prescription, we had the usual Bekenstein-Hawking formula, A over 4G. Um, what that really means is that it's the coefficient of the Ricci scalar that appears in that formula. And so the A, well, the higher dimensional A is associated with this diloton. And so if I'm applying the root Akinagi surface here, or the prescription here, what I would be doing is I'd be, well, I'd have a boundary surface. That's, that's just a time slice, it's a point. I'd wanna know what's the entanglement entropy. And by that, I mean, what's the entanglement entropy between this quantum mechanical system and the one representing the other side. So I want to find a surface in the bulk here that extremizes the area, or rather it extremizes the diloton over 4G. And what I would find given that uh, this, well, given this solution with this profile is that the root Takinagi surface would in fact sit on the bifurcation surface, or it would sit in the middle of my X here where the past and future horizons are all meeting. And so that would be the root Takinagi surface. And I would say that that characterizes the entanglement between the two quantum mechanical systems. But what we're doing now is we're using the idea of a quantum extremal surface. And so there, what I'm doing is I'm extremizing not just the area over 4G or the diloton over 4G, but I'm also taking into account the entanglement entropy contributed by the matter fields or the quantum fields on a partial Cauchy surface that extends from my surface out to the boundary uh, surface. Now, you might think, well, if I have this as say my quantum extremal surface and this is my boundary surface, there are lots of uh, you know, Cauchy surfaces or spatial lines that connect the two. 
But in fact, because of unitarity, the entanglement entropy of the quantum fields on both of those surfaces would be identical. And the only way to really vary is not by varying that surface there, but the way that you vary the, the, uh, in, the quantum entanglement entropy is by moving this red dot around in the bulk. And so you might find that when it's here, that the variations are extremized. In this particular case, that wouldn't be, if I had an eternal black hole, I would actually end up back here. That would still be the quantum extremal surface. But in the case of an evaporating black hole, what you would find is that there are different uh, saddle points or there are different places where that combination is extremized. And that's what leads to the possibility of finding the page curve. In particular, what you find is that in this first part, where the entropy is growing, it's a saddle point where the quantum extremal surface is more or less very close to that X or to the original horizon. But then a new extremal surface arises that describes this behavior here where the entropy is decaying um, in the last half of the page curve. There's also some indication, and I'll explain that in detail uh, later, but that the radiation actually carries information about the interior of the black hole. And that gives rise to the idea of a quantum extremal island. Um, but we'll get back to that later. I, again, I'm not giving you any details. You'll see more details in a moment um, when I go to higher dimensions, but that's just to give you a flavor for the kind of theory that they were looking, the kind of calculations that they were doing, and that here's the result. Surprisingly, when we use this holographic entanglement entropy or this quantum extension of the holographic entanglement entropy, there were different extremal surfaces and there was a competition between those surfaces and the new one, or, or the, there was a new surface that actually described this decay of uh, the, 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 the entanglement entropy in the last half of the bit. Okay, so what did these folks here do? What did the folks in the August paper do? Well, they said, well, the calculations that Almeri Engelhart Marl from Maxfield did introduced this two-dimensional uh, conformal field theory, and it, it ran over both the, the region with gravity, with JT gravity, and it ran over the bath region where there was no gravity. And they said, well, if I don't pick any particular, it, you know, there could have been any particular uh, CFT here, but what they're going to do is they're going to say, well, let's pick a CFT that in fact is holographic. In that case, when I have this CFT, I can replace it by a description in terms of a dual three-dimensional anti-de Sitter space. And similarly, the CFT in the gravitational region there'd be some kind of uh, ADS region that replaces that um, and couples to uh, this region with gravity. Um, the full story involves other objects in the hol holographic setup, these sort of end of the world brains, the blue region is now called a Planck brain. Again, I'm not going to go into the details, um, but the key idea was let's not focus our attention on any old CFT, let's focus our attention on holographic CFTs. And then it seems there's this other layer of holography. I now have three descriptions of the system, one in terms of purely quantum field theory, quantum mechanics, one in terms of quantum field theory and a JT, a two-dimensional gravity, and then another one that involves a three-dimensional gravity and a two-dimensional gravity that are talking to each other. You, of course, recover the same set of curves. It's again, it's an example of the, of the calculation that you did here. But now you can understand that in terms of Rutakianagi surfaces and all of these different uh, uh, parts of the page curve can be described. There's a corresponding saddle point or extremal surface or RT surface in the uh, three dimensional gravity theory that goes along with each uh, one of these different kinds of behavior. And 
Well, now we have some new insight into the information paradox. In fact, we reproduce um, the page curve, and so it, it does seem to suggest that there's not a loss of information, but I'm rather sorry there's to, a... I'm oh. sorry to interrupt sure. you again. <clears throat> so this two-dimensional gravity or radius to emerges at some fixed point of the renomination group of the three-dimensional gravity theory? No, it's a little bit different than that. And I'll, it, it's easier just to, for me to defer the question and, and let you think uh, or describe the higher dimensional version of it. Uh -huh. I mean, what I'm saying here is you've got these new insights, but there were actually all sorts of questions that one arose. I mean, they, they seem to uh, pull these models out of a hat and I say, see. here it is, and this is how it works. And, you know, they're very smart people and they got the right answers, but one was left ans asking questions, you know, how important was it that they were working with two-dimensional gravity? Yeah. You know, are the degrees of freedom on this thing I'm calling the Planck brain or the JT gravity, are those degrees of freedom, should I really think of them as part of the boundary theory yeah. in the language of ADS, CFT, or should I think yeah. of them as part of the bulk? Um, was it important that I was using JT gravity as opposed to Einstein gravity? Well, in two dimensions, there is no Einstein gravity. Was the ensemble average that you're doing in the SYK model, was that an important element in producing this page curve? You know, um, We've got the page curve, but how is the information encoded in the Hawking radiation? How is it actually getting out of the black hole? Those are all questions that, that you could ask. And I can tell you answers to some of those questions, but I know those answers because of what I'm gonna talk about next. Oh, um, okay. And really what it is, is I think this was a brilliant insight, but I think it's also something that um, we can understand, at least uh, from, for me, I can understand them from familiar properties of holographic entanglement entropy. And, and it's, it's uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm just presenting another framework, another perspective, where I hope that one can gain more insight into what's really going on in this system. And that's gonna be my objective in the next part of the talk. And, and so this was just a brief overview of you know, what kickstarted all of this, uh, this new uh, research program. And I'll, I'll just pause there though and ask if there are any other questions. Well, if, if not, I'll just, we'll, we'll carry on and we'll start to think, you know, the, 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 there was, it, it, well, originally when, we, when I saw this, it seemed very puzzling um, and I wanted to understand it in a more familiar context, but I also wanted to understand it in a context where two dimensions wasn't playing a role. And I, so I wanted to think about higher dimensions. Now to make progress there, I really have to go back and again, review another topic. And this is the idea of randall sundom gravity. This was something that, that emerged uh, shortly after the ADS-CFT emerged, um, but it was a new way to think about, um, well, originally their model was uh, to think about uh, gravity in our world, in our four dimensional world as perhaps being induced from a theory in higher dimensions, that, that the gravity actually propagated in a higher dimensional world. And so what they did is they introduced uh, a brain, which I'm, I'm just gonna say is D-dimensional. That, that D-dimensional brain couples to gravity with a negative cosmological constant or it lives in anti de Sitter space in one higher dimension. And so what well, happens is that the, the back reaction of the brain on the geometry actually induces a new graviton mode that's localized in the vicinity of the brain. Sorry, was there a question? Yeah, this is probably the, because I'm, uh, there are a lot of RS gravity models. So this one is the one brain model, people used to call it. Um, I forget if it's type two or type one. This yeah, is the yeah, one yeah. that has a brain in the UV. 
and yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we don't have plunk, a brain in the so, NIR brain. So this is, you call the plank brain, probably. This is what, yeah, this brain is going to become the plank brain yeah. uh, in, in the previous uh, discussion. Yeah, true. Yeah. So as I said, we have our deepest one-dimensional gravity. It's just Einstein gravity. There's a cosmological constant, a negative cosmological constant. The L here becomes the curvature scale of my ADS geometry. And then I have a brain that has a, a fixed tension. Um, there, in, in the paper we put out last month, there's a whole long discussion about you know, other things you could do. You could imagine that there's actually an intrinsic theory of gravity that lives on this brain. That's something that you can use the words DGP for Diwali, Gabadadze, Parati. They thought about um, similar brain world models um, where there was actually a higher dimensional gravity, but there were um, already intrinsic gravity terms that lived on the brain. Um, for our purposes, uh, what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk, this doesn't really matter, but it's simple to incorporate them into the story as well. And it all works out more or less the same. But I'm just going to ignore it for now. I'm just going to work with this. And I'm going to think about the, the geometry uh, that we have. Or rather, I, first thing I should say is, well, what I said is that this induces a gravity theory on the brain. And that gravity theory looks like this. It, um, again, it, I've, I've actually tuned uh, the brain tension so that there's a negative cosmological constant. And um, I'm going to work in a regime where this is actually a very large scale. The curvature scale is, in fact, much larger than the, the L of the bulk space. And there's a formula then, roughly, that relates this effective curvature scale to the bulk uh, cosmological constant. Here's Newton's constant. Here's the tension of the brain. And so this came out of the full Einstein equations that coupled the, the ADS gravity to the brain. There's also a, uh, an, an Einstein term on the brain, and it comes with a Newton's constant. And that Newton's constant is related to the bulk Newton's constant and, again, the ADS scale. And then there are lots of higher curvature terms. Um, so, that for I mean, we in our paper, we write explicitly what the R squared terms are, but it's a whole series of terms, R squared, R cubed, et cetera, et cetera. As I said, I'm going to work in a regime where this scale is much larger than the bulk ADS scale. And what that means, well, when I take inverses, is this uh, quantity is much less, uh, well, the bulk, the brain uh, cosmological constant is much less than the bulk cosmological constant. And what that means is then that this term here is suppressed by the ratio of these two terms. It's suppressed by a factor of capital L squared over L effective squared relative to the first two terms. And so if I'm in this regime where this inequality holds, I can think that to a very good approximation, the, the theory on the brain is a theory of Einstein gravity coupled to a negative cosmological constant. But there is a certain amount of tuning, of course. I chose the tension of my brain in a very particular way to make this quantity small, and in fact, to make it much smaller than the bulk cosmological constant. Okay, so what, given that, that, that tells us about the, the brain theory, but what was the bulk geometry that we're working with? Well, I can think about it in two different ways. Uh, the first way, just thinking about it from uh, the bulk, there's the solution locally away from the brain, the solution is just an ADS geometry. So here's the usual kind of picture that we draw as a cross-section of uh, anti de Sitter space. I'm going to foliate it with surfaces here that are anti de Sitter spaces of one less dimension. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to chop it off at some value uh, that I'm calling row brain. So I'm, I'm going to um, 
go through the space. There are lots of anti desitter slices, but I'm just going to pick one here and I'm going to chop it off. I'm going to make another copy of that and then I'm going to glue them together. Now, when I glue them together, there's a jump in the extrinsic curvature at that surface. And that's given using the usual Israel junction conditions. That's given by uh, this combination of the brain tension and uh, the, the bulk gravitational uh, Newton's constant. And so given that, uh, given those two parameters in my original model, that tells me exactly where I'm supposed to stick the brain. And so what I get then is uh, because this L effective is very large, I get two regions of space time that almost look like a complete anti de Sitter space, but I, if I head off in that direction, rather than get, being able to go to infinity, I actually run into the brain, this, this green or greenish yellow, and then I would cross over and I'd find that there's another anti de Sitter space over here. So that's one way to describe uh, the geometry. The other way is, well, I have this induced theory um, and I can just solve the equations of motion for that gravity theory. And that tells me then that I need a surface that essentially has this curvature scale here, or it has that curvature scale up to corrections. And so I can just look at the various slices and using that equation, I can pick out the slice that has the appropriate curvature scale. And I can say, well, that's where the brain must live because that's the, uh, those are the gravitational equations of motion that it has to satisfy. And in fact, the remarkable thing is, or what seems remarkable, is that these two approaches, one where I'm just using bulk geometry and one where I'm using the induced gravity, they actually lead to exactly the same answer. But that's in part the, the consistency of Randall's son of gravity, that you can either describe this in terms of the bulk geometry or in terms of the induced theory on the brain. One other note is that, uh, you know, this is just, this is an accurate depiction or a more accurate depiction of what's going on, but I'm gonna be lazy and I'm gonna draw pictures like this, where I've got a cross section of ADS and then I'll draw a green line through the middle. But what you should keep in mind is that the, that brain is back reacting and there's lots of extra space time in the vicinity of that green line. So this is just a cartoon and it's a simple kind of a cartoon to draw. Another remark is about the holographic entanglement entropy. Here I've got an ADS system. Uh, you know, there's an ADS boundary, there's this brain in the middle. I can use the root Akinagi formula. And one of the thing, one of the remarkable things that I'll just comment on is that you get actually a contribution that looks like uh, the Bekenstein Hawking formula that's coming from this action. Now, one thing to remember is that this gravity theory that I'm talking about, in some sense, well, it is an induced theory. I mean, originally we started with a brain. Uh, it just had the usual tension term but now I'm describing it in terms of this induced gravity. Um, and so we've induced the gravity. So in some sense, the uh, entire gravity theory is a quantum contribution. Um, I mean, I talked about there could be an intrinsic or a classical gravitational term, but for now we're just uh, discarding it. But the remarkable thing is that when I calculate my holographic entanglement entropy, and my RT surface crosses over the brain, what I'll find is that there's a contribution that's coming where the RT surface crosses the brain that looks very much, well, like what I expected. It's the area of the cross section here on the brain divided by four times the effective Newton's constant. And in fact, if you take into account the higher curvature terms here, in our paper, we looked at the R squared term. What you find is that you get the entire, uh, what I'll call uh, wall dong entropy for that particular surface on the brain. And it's, it's really, when I say wall dong entropy, Wald was the first person to think about 
uh, or he was one of the first people. He was he was he came up with a uh, interesting way to uh, derive the black hole entropy for um, uh, theories of higher curvature gravity. Um, Dong uh, extended that because he was thinking about um, uh, uh, actually higher curvatures theories of uh, bulk theories in holography or in ADS CFT. And he was asking, what would the prescription be for the, um, you know, instead of just using the Bekstein Hawking formula, I would use some other formula for the, uh, to extremize, to calculate the entanglement entropy. And in fact, the difference is that in his case, because it's not a black hole horizon, or in particular, it's not a stationary black hole horizon, which goes into Wall's derivation, various extra terms involving extrinsic curvatures appear here in the dot, dot, dot. To leading order, they both agree on the Bekstein Hawking term, the higher order terms here, well, it's not that Wald is wrong. It, Dong's formula just extends Wald's formula to cases where the surface has extrinsic curvature. But the full RT surface also has non-local quantum uh, gravitational contributions. Um, and that's why I've got two sets of dot, dot, dot. I get this as the leading contribution here. I get some other geometric terms, but then there are also just intrinsically quantum contributions to the entanglement entropy. Um, why did we get this? Well, just you might remember uh, when I talked about the entanglement entropy that it had this power law expansion in terms of a cutoff. When I'm talking about holographic entanglement entropy, that's because although this car in this cartoon, you know, the, the ADS space has a finite boundary. There's actually an infinite amount of space and infinite amount of area here. And so when I'm evaluating it, I get terms that are divergent in exactly the way I expected. And so I have to introduce a cutoff surface and there's a whole story to be told about that. But this is actually a success of the RT prescription that you're finding the same UV divergent terms that you might in a quantum field theory calculation. But it's just telling you that there are large contributions to the area coming here because there's a lot of geometry in that picture. And in the same way, I said that there's a lot of extra geometry in the vicinity of the brain. In this case, it just works out in the correct way that what you find is an area term where the coefficient is precisely one over four G effective, where that's the Newton's constant in the Andrews uh, gravity theory here. And again, it's a reflection of the consistency of this Randall center of prescription. So those are a lot of details, but basically what's the story here? Well, I now have a higher dimensional theory, but in, in parallel to what I showed you in two dimensions, I have three descriptions of it. The first description would be entirely in terms of a boundary theory. What I would have there is a D-dimensional CFT living on a sphere, and it's coupled to a conformal defect that runs around the equator. And I can think of that defect as supporting a conformal theory of one lower dimension. So I have, say, if D was equal to four, I'd have a, uh, a three sphere. That's a time slice. It evolves in time. Time is the extra dimension. So I have a three sphere. That's where my CFT lives. And then around the equator, I have a two sphere. And that's where this defect theory lives. Now, ADS CFT says that that boundary theory is equivalent to this picture here, where I've got my Einstein gravity coupled to this brain. And again, I'm, I'm reminding you, this is a cartoon. There's lots of extra geometry hidden near the brain. But I also have this other description, this sort of halfway house where what I'm doing is I'm doing not holography on the entire boundary system, but I'm only doing holography on the defect theory. And I'm going to replace that defect theory by um, a gravity theory, this, this induced gravity theory on uh, the brain. And so this is the Randall syndrome gravity 
in the geometry that I set up, that's a hyperbolic space that just cuts through the middle of anti de Sitter space. And so this itself, the spatial slice is, is given by that, but that green also evolves in time. And so that would actually be an anti de Sitter space in uh, D dimensions. Oops. So that's very much like the three layers that we had before. Um, uh, maybe I shouldn't even. But remember, I had three layers here. One was quantum mechanical, coupled to another CFT. Another was a gravity theory, coupled to a CFT. And then I had a theory where I had a bulk gravity coupled to a brain. And that's exactly the same, or well, it's not exactly, it's more or less the same as the three pictures that I'm offering you here. I have a boundary theory. Um, this is like my quantum mechanics. It's the defect that's coupled to a, a higher a, a CFT. Uh, I've got the dual of the defect theory being the gravity theory, the randall sundin gravity on the brain. Um, and that's coupling again to the boundary CFT. Or the final description, I, I've got the Einstein gravity and the bulk, and it's coupled to the brain. And so those are the parallel, it's a higher dimensional parallel of the two dimensional uh, story that I told you before. Now, I've been promising you that I was going to reproduce uh, this page curve, but in fact, I'm going to do a much simpler calculation. Um, and uh, so there's a, a little bit of a uh, uh, well, I'm cheating here. One in principle could do this calculation. It, would, it, it has not yet been done, but it's just much more involved in higher dimensions. And so I'm going to do a simpler calculation where I think about thermal equilibrium or a system in thermal equilibrium. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, look at a, this is actually a subsequent paper that came out in the fall for two dimensions. And they wanted to look at the same holographic model, you know, with the 2D gravity, the one dimensional quantum mechanical systems. They wanted to prepare a state where I have a two dimensional black hole in thermal equilibrium with a bath at a finite temperature. So how do you, essentially what they're describing is the hartle hawking state. How do you describe the hartle hawking state for in uh, the black hole? Well, you you think about the Euclidean black hole, and uh, in the Euclidean case, the time, the Euclidean time becomes periodic, and that periodicity is set by making sure that the geometry is smooth at the place where the horizon put. And so this is my two-dimensional now Euclidean black hole. I want to couple it to the bath. I want a bath at a finite temperature, and so well, a quantum field theory at finite temperature is evaluated, or its partition function is evaluated by thinking about the quantum field theory on a Euclidean uh, a cylinder. So I, I have a Euclidean time, again, that's periodic. And if I want these two systems to be in equilibrium, I have to match the periods of the Euclidean time in the gravitational region or in the black hole with the periodicity here. Um, in the non-gravitational region where I just have my two-dimensional CFT at finite temperature. Um, that's sort of a calculation one does for a partition function. To think of it as preparing a state, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that geometry and I'm gonna cut it through the middle. And so I'm going to take a, uh, a Euclidean time slice, that fixed Euclidean time. It runs down to the horizon here and then comes up the opposite side. And now I've got a geometry, or I've got a state, which I could imagine propagating forward in uh, Lorentzian time. And so this bottom half, what I've done is I've just taken this picture, or I've taken the bottom half of the picture, and I've just squashed it all out or flattened it out on the plane. This is my Euclidean black hole, which has uh, had a periodicity, but I've taken half of it. And this is my CFT on the cylinder. And again, I've taken half of the cylinder. And so we have the state here at the dotted line. 
and then we evolve it forward in time. And what I have up here is an eternal black hole. And here I've got um, my, my thermal bath in flat space, in two-dimensional Minkowski space. And I've tuned the, the parameters so that the temperature here matches the temperature of the black hole. I could also forget where it came from, and I could just think about the uh, Lorentzian picture. You know, I could evolve it forward and backward, and then I've just got this usual picture of an eternal black hole. This is the kind of picture that I was showing you before of a, J, of a black hole in JT gravity. This is an anti de Sitter space, a two dimensional anti de Sitter space. And I've just at the boundary or near the boundary, I've connected it on both sides to uh, flat Minkowski space. And in that flat Minkowski space, I've got a two dimensional CFT at finite temperature. Is that construction clear to people or would you like to ask a question about it? There were a lot of words there, I'm, I'm just worried. Well, well, we'll carry on. One thing you may think is, well, I told you the systems at thermal equilibrium, why would there be any kind of information paradox? Why would I be talking about that in this particular context? Well, I, I do have, uh, a black hole and a bath, and they're both at the same temperature. But as it evolves in time, as the system evolves in time, they're continuously exchanging radiation. There's radiation that's falling from the thermal bath into the black hole, and there's Hawking radiation climbing up out of the black hole and leaking into the thermal bath region. Overall, there's a there's an equilibrium, and so the amount of radiation that falls in equals the amount of radiation that leaks out. But there is a continuous exchange of quanta. And if I think about correlated pairs, because of the construction, this quanta in the thermal bath is related to this quanta in the uh, opposite side. Um, this quanta heads off to infinity, whereas this quantum falls into the black hole and eventually falls into the black hole and disappears up here. So that's a process where on one side, um, you know, if I was just keeping track of the radiation in the thermal bath, I'm, I'm actually losing some of the information here or I'm growing the entanglement between the black hole and the thermal bath. Similarly, it can work the other way where, you know, here are two quanta that are in the black hole and they're correlated. This quanta climbs out and heads out into the bath. This quanta falls into the black hole and again disappears into this region. So again, through this process, through this exchange, we're increasing the entanglement between the bath and the black hole. And so there is something like an information paradox in that that process continues uh, for an infinite amount of time. And so you might think that if I start down here, you know, with some fixed amount of entropy, that that entropy is just growing continuously as these ex this exchange of radiation appears or occurs at the interface between the, the black hole and the thermal bath, and that it would continue growing without bound. On the other hand, if we think of the black hole, as a quantum system, it can only, it has a finite number of degrees of freedom and it can only store a finite amount of information. And so eventually that growth should stop and the, the total entanglement entropy should be uh, fixed. Um, and, and so the curve should grow like this and then should, should be capped off. If this was two ordinary quantum systems, what it is is that you've just exchanged so much radiation um, that in subsequent exchanges, in some sense, what you're doing is you're recycling quanta that originally fell in are now being uh, recycled and are leaking out again. And that's why there's a, you know, there's a finite or, or there's a maximum amount of information that can fall into the system and then you cap off and the entropy doesn't grow after a certain amount of time. And certainly what these authors, these three authors up here did, and there's related work here, is they found precisely that, oops, 
precisely that behavior. Um, and what they found was, you know, what they were asking is this, this is my picture. They were asking what's the entanglement entropy of the, the bath or a large portion of the bath with the black hole. And they found initially there's a, a phase in which the entropy grows, but then just like there was before, they found that there was a new extremal set of extremal surfaces in the bulk. And so when I evaluated at late times, uh, the entropy, in fact, the entropy was constant, but it, it had this curious effect that even though I'm evaluating just the entropy of this bath out here, there's an extremal surface, or there are these pair of extremal surfaces here in the bulk, in the gravitational region. And the prescription, the Rutaki, or the extended Rutakinagi prescription, is that those are contributing to the entanglement entropy up here. And so this region. Um, in here, between these two extremal, quantum extremal surfaces is what was known as the island, or, or is now known as the quantum extremal island. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the argument is that the radiation here uh, in the bath contains information about this part of uh, the geometry as well, or this blue region um, in the interior of the black hole. So somehow, when the radiation leaked out, it's done it in a very complicated way, and there's information stored out here that can tell me about the interior of the black hole. And again, that may seem mysterious right now, but uh, what I'll say is that it hopefully it'll become more apparent in a moment when I think about my higher dimensional model. One of the puzzles at the time where they thought it was a puzzle was also that these quantum extremal surfaces actually lay outside of the horizon, whereas in all previous problems, the quantum extremal surface lay inside the horizon. And so that was uh, a different property that appeared in this particular problem, the equilibrium problem. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to reproduce that or see how it's reproduced in, in my system where I had this uh, D plus one dimensional gravity coupled to a brain, and that produced an induced gravity on this, this brain theory. So what I have to ask you to do though, is I have to, let's remember some, just forget about the brain for the moment and just remember something about anti de Sitter space. This is just empty anti de Sitter. It's, it's in some sense, it's, it's the, the, the vacuum geometry but it can just be described with a set of coordinates where there's something that looks like a horizon. And this set of coordinates, you know, the GTT vanishes when rho equals L and, and there's a divergence in the, the radial part. And you can think of this as a topological black hole. I mean, there's a family of such solutions. If I vary this parameter, it's no longer empty ADS space, but they're, they're called these hyperbolic black holes or topological black holes. In this particular case, um, where it's just empty ADS, what I'm describing is a thermofield double state of the boundary CFT. And the boundary geometry is this geometry in this little uh, diamond that sits between the two orange disks here on the, on the boundary. Um, and that geometry is, well, it can be read off from this metric here. There's the time direction, but then the geometry here, this is actually a hyperbolic plane. And so this is actually then a thermofield double between two copies of the CFT, one here and one here. And they're both sitting in this background geometry where I have time across a hyperbolic plane. And there's a very specific temperature that's related to this choice being rho equals L or this being just empty anti de Sitter space. And so the temperature here is related to the curvature scale of the hyperbolic plane. That's, that's this R. So that's just empty ADS space. I wanted to introduce a brain. And so all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that geometry, that coordinate system, and I'm gonna stick a brain 
down through the middle of it. And so my picture looks like that. And now what I have is a thermophile double of my boundary CFT, now coupled to a conformal defect, the conformal defect being where the brain uh, intersects the boundary. But away from that, the geometry is again, just this same R cross hyperbolic plane, and the temperature is just this one over two pi R. And so the only thing I've done in the boundary theory now is I've been inserted a conformal defect in the middle of my space. As far as the bulk geometry is concerned, I've just inserted this brain. And so if I think about it, what I've got on the brain is I'm just inheriting, uh, well, okay, this is the two-dimensional example. I had this uh, 80, or I had the bath, which was just in flat space. And then I had the black hole, which was in anti dissider Well, it was a particular coordinate system in anti dissider space. Now what I've got is a higher dimensional picture, but it's a, more or less the same. I've got a bath. The bath now has uh, this curious geometry. It's got a hyperbolic plane cross R. And I've got an induced geometry on the brain, which is also an anti dissider space, but I, it inherits these coordinates or that coordinate system. And so it looks like there's a horizon. That's the horizon that appeared uh, in the bulk. It's in the same horizon appears in the, on the brain theory. And so I can think of this as a hyperbolic black hole or an ADSD black hole. So this is just a natural extension of the two dimensional picture here with the two just going to higher dimensions. The one extra thing here is that this bath space was actually a half of anti uh, a half of flat space. And then in the middle, it joined on to the gravitational region. Uh, here, I've actually got two sides, and I'll draw another picture. I've got two sides. This is like I took the whole flat space and I, the defect sits in the middle of it. It's not quite flat space in that it has this geometry instead. It's this geometry with a hyperbolic uh, spatial slices and the defect sits in the middle. And that's why the picture here is a little bit more involved to show that there's actually two sides uh, to the bath that are coupling to the brain in the, or the defect in the middle. Oh yeah, well, that's just what I was saying. And so the picture that I get is something like this. Um, this is my boundary. Remember it was a little, you know, the Penrose diagram is still the same diamond that I had before uh, for flat space, um, but it represents now this geometry. And then in the middle of the space, I've got this conformal defect and the induced geometry on that defect is again, uh, some kind of uh, hyperbolic spatial slices. Now, if I think about time slices in this geometry, or, oh, no, yeah, okay, this, sorry, this picture gets glued onto the boundary of the ADS here, and so that green line is where the, the brain is reaching the boundary, and, you know, you can see these two corners are where the, the horizon or the orange disks are coming together, and then the maximum, well, is where the green line is. And there's actually two copies. There's one on this side and one on this side. Now I wanna think about time slices or how time evolved in this boundary theory. And so what I have is this is T equals zero. It's just cuts across the middle of the space. But if I evolve using the natural time coordinate, um, what I find is the time slices go up like this. And what happens is if I sit at a fixed radius, I actually follow a path like this that takes me up uh, to the top corner up here. And so in this picture here then, uh, even though the natural geometry that I use on this, um, all of these slices are equivalent. If I look at it from this uh, global perspective, it looks like these are growing in the boundary. These two points are growing closer together they're both approaching the same uh, dime or endpoint or tip of the diamond up here as I evolve in time. 
So in particular, I'm going to do a, uh, an entanglement entropy where I'm going to ask what's the entanglement between this region and the region in the, in the dual copy, how are they entangled with the defect here? And I'm going to do that using holographic entanglement entropy. But again, uh, you know, what I'm doing is I'm drawing this now on the boundary of the ADS. So here's my t equals zero slice uh, as the boundary. I had the brain running through the middle. These are the, it reaches the green point. Um, the horizon are these corners here. So that's where these corners map onto. So here's one copy. Here's the other copy. And this blue slice with the black dot is just the same as this blue slice. But you can see that the two copies actually match or fit together in the in the boundary theory, and the blue slices mold, meld together. Even though this in this conformal frame, this looks like infinity. It's actually very very close to the other infinity. And then we're involving in time, and what's happening is these points are moving closer and closer to the brain when I look at it from the global perspective. Now, this picture here may be reminiscent of something that people have thought about in entanglement entropy or holographic entanglement entropy. And there, what they would have done is they would have, again, we put aside the brain for a moment. It's just empty ADS space. And I'm thinking about the entanglement region between two, saw, two, two regions, one which have, each of which has two components. Here, I've got a component on this side and a component on this side. And in fact, there are two possible contenders to be the RT surface. One would be one which just caps off this side and this side. And then another one would be where I join the opposite sides. And so I'd have these dotted lines. And so the question is, remember, I'm supposed to minimize the area. And so both of those are extremal surfaces, but I have to choose the minimal one. Turns out when this is, these regions are small, that the minimal region is these capping off surfaces. And the pink region here is the corresponding entanglement wedge. But when, when these blue regions grow, in fact, the other saddle point or the other extremal surfaces win. And what happens is you get into this phase here and now the entanglement wedge is this entire region. And so something miraculous has happened. These points in the middle of the space, well, they weren't in the entanglement wedge before. And so the information that I had in this blue region and this blue region couldn't tell me anything about the degrees of freedom in the middle of this geometry. But now when, it, when the blue regions are expanded somewhat, uh, there's this phase transition or this jump from one saddle to the other. And now, according to entanglement wedge reconstruction, I can reproduce uh, or I have information about what's happening in the middle of my anti disser space. And this is just, I, well, okay, this is words. Uh, this is just what I explained. The entanglement wedge is the interior of those surfaces. But here the interior includes the middle of the space. And so in principle, information about those degrees of freedom is encoded in the state on the blue region. Now, the only thing, these pictures look more or less like what I had before. The only thing I'm doing is I'm drawing a green line down the middle to represent my brains, but you should keep in mind that there's a lot of extra geometry in the vicinity of those brains. And that shifts exactly when the uh, transition between the two saddles occurs. But the time evolution takes me from a picture that looks like this. And that's the early time phase where the RT surfaces, well, I've drawn orthogonal to the brain, I've drawn the horizon. The RT surfaces now join opposite sides of the black hole or they cross over the horizon. And as time evolves, the entanglement entropy grows but the entanglement wedge here is very, very close to the boundary surface. On the other hand, eventually we get to a point where we make this phase transition or we jump to this other saddle. 
And in that, uh, oh, well, this was, yeah, these were early times. Entanglement entropy was growing, so that's the growth phase. But at late times, I go to this other saddle, and now the entanglement surfaces uh, or the RT surfaces say on one side of the horizon. But the interesting thing is they now go through the um, brain. Turns out that although in, from this perspective, things are changing when you do it from the uh, perspective of the boundary theory, the entanglement entropy is fixed in time for this. But again, the, the interesting thing is the entanglement wedge goes across the brain. And so in this phase, I have this state includes information about what's going on in the middle of the space. In particular, it includes information for, about what's happening on this region of the brain. But that is then precisely from the brain perspective, that is the quantum extremal island. It's the region where the entanglement wedge crosses over the brain. And this would be the page, page phase. This is where the entanglement entropy is fixed in time. Now that, that uh, discussion, I mean, the brain um, makes it interesting and it portrays it in this context of the uh, information paradox. We can also think about it though from uh, the perspective of other things, you know, now it's just a holographic entanglement entropy calculation. And so one of the things we might do is we might think instead of the blue regions, let's think that we're thinking about the entanglement entropy of the black region, the, the complement of the blue region. The RT surfaces are identical, but now it's the light blue that is the entanglement wedge. What this describes is then, uh, it's very comparable to an analysis that Hartman and Maldacena did many years ago. And what they were arguing was that the system here in this phase, the entanglement entropy is actually increasing and it's because the system is thermalizing, but it rapidly thermalizes and then reaches a fixed entropy or, or it reaches its equilibrium. At this point, the entanglement entropy is fixed by the, the temperature of the system and there's no further growth. And so this, is a, this behavior is a behavior that we can recognize by looking back in the literature. A another feature that from that perspective uh, or from the perspective of these complementary regions is obvious is that these surfaces do not touch the horizon or don't appear inside the horizon. And, and that comes just from a property known as entanglement wedge uh, nesting, which means that this black region its entanglement wedge has to be smaller than the entanglement wedge of the blue region or the entire boundary that reaches from this corner, oops, from this end to that end. That entanglement wedge would in fact be, uh, or would touch the RT surface, would be the horizon. These RT surfaces have to be enclosed within uh, that entanglement wedge. And so they have to appear outside the horizon. So what this shows is this, this higher dimensional system uh, just precisely reproduces all of this behavior uh, that we've seen well in these uh, 2D models. But now we're seeing it from the perspective of perhaps more familiar properties of entanglement entropy. And I've been talking a lot there for a long time, so I'm, I'm gonna pause because I, I have a feeling there must be some questions, perhaps. Are there any questions about uh, everything that I've been talking about there? About Guys, please ask questions. Uh, hi, I have a question. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's not directly related to uh, your model, but it's, a little bit more general. Uh, in, in, in these models, it seems to me that, so you're talking about the, uh, you're looking at the entanglement entropy of, of radiation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but when we talk about uh, the um, entropy of a black hole, the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, mm -hmm. 
it is the entropy of entanglement of uh, geometric degrees of freedom, right? Or quantum geometric degrees of freedom. Right. Yeah. So, so the question is that, like, what happens to these quantum geometric degrees of freedom in these models? Where, where are they? Where are they hiding? I mean. Oh yeah. No, I, I. Um... I think yeah okay let me go back <clears throat> I maybe I didn't yeah I, well I know I didn't say this point but I, I'll use this slide I mean one of the one of the the descriptions we have for this is the boundary theory there I don't I'm talking about an entanglement problem in that boundary theory and so there are no, um, you know, quantum gravity degrees of freedom. Um, mm -hmm. There are quantum de gravity free degrees of freedom here um, in the dual gravity theory. You know what? Uh, you know what our what uh, the Rutakini pre prescription does is it translates the uh, entanglement entropy problem here into a geometric property of the gravity theory. It's just the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy of the extremal surface. And, you know, the truth is that's reflecting, I guess, the entropy that you're interested in. That's reflecting uh, an entropy of the quantum gravity degrees of freedom in that bulk geometry. Um, but, the, you know, we have arguments for this being the right formula in terms of a Euclidean path integral but the truth is that it's really only, uh, uh, well, it's a semi-classical argument and it's saying just that the leading term is the Bekenstein-Hawking formula. But what you're asking is, well, that Bekenstein-Hawking formula should be associated with an entanglement of microscopic quantum gravity. And, and the puzzle is that, and I'll say a bit more about this towards the end, the, the real puzzle is that we, we, we haven't really derived that. We, we use the Euclidean path integral um, to argue for this being the right answer, but we don't have a microscopic picture of uh, those quantum gr gravity degrees of freedom at this point in time. Does, does that answer the question? Um, well, I mean, mm, not really. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, I mean, I mean, I mean, because I guess, I guess my question, like, is, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess, uh, yeah, the answer is what you're saying is that, yeah, the situation is not clear as to uh, what is really going on at a microscopic level. At the, in, the, in the quantum gravity, yeah, it, we, we don't understand mm. what, what at, at this point in time, we, it's fair to say we don't really understand at the microscopic level what, what's happening. And, and that's a theme that I'll, 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 I'll get back to yeah shortly. Uh, so can I just follow up on that? Sure. So mm, the thing is that like unless we actually understand uh, the microscopic degrees of freedom, can we really claim to have uh, a solution? I'm going to defer that question. I'm going to defer that question uh, to the to later on in the talk. Sure, no problem. Okay. Okay, so let's let's just so so I I uh, it, yeah it may not be uh, entirely clear, but but the the basically the idea is there were these calculations they were done with a two D theory you know very special kind of gravity a very special kind of uh, well a two dimensional theory and what I'm saying here is well you can you can really extend them to higher dimensions and so that's a a, a well, that, that's, that's somewhat of an insight. The, the other insight is that, you know, in this framework, you know, I talked before about these quantum extremal surfaces and there was a geometric contribution and a quantum contribution. In these holographic uh, calculations, the beauty is that it, in, the, in the bulk theory where I have an ADS bulk and a brain, it's all just purely geometric. All of that is captured uh, you know, the quantum contributions or the planar contributions, at least, 
and the, the geometric contributions are all captured just with the root Akinagi formula. I never had to do any quantum calculations. It was purely geometric um, in the way that we usually do for holographic entanglement entropy. And so I just wanted to spend a little bit of time, uh, you know, understanding what I've learned from this new model where we've lifted everything from two dimensions to higher dimensions. Um, so one of the questions at the very beginning we might have asked is, are the degrees of freedom here on the Planck brain part of the boundary or part of the bulk? You know, implicitly in the pictures I drew, I had RT surfaces and they were ending on the Planck brain. And so can I really end my RT surface in the middle of the geometry on a brain? Um, you know, does the Bass state really describe what's going on in terms uh, in the quantum extremal island down here in the gravity region? Um, and, you know, in, in our construction, I think this becomes all very clear. Um, you know, one of the reasons we did it this way is that we've got a bulk brain and it just runs through the middle of the space and you would never be confused and say, well, that's part of the boundary theory. It, clearly, those degrees of freedom are part of the bulk. Um, the RT surfaces don't end on the brain. They simply cross. You know, we're interested in problems where the RT surface can cross over the brain from one side to the other. Um, when we discover a quantum extremal island, what it is is it's just that the entanglement wedge now captures part of the brain physics. And so the, yes, you can with the radiation describe what's going on in this part of the bulk geometry or on this part of the black hole from the brain perspective. Of course, I could turn this picture into the picture that, uh, you know, our friends doing the two-dimensional calculations were doing. And, and essentially what I would do is I take a Z2 orbifold. I just say there's a reflection symmetry across my picture and I would, uh, well, I'd mod out. Um, and what that would do then is that this surface that looked like it was crossing the brain originally in my, in my covering space, it now ends on the brain. Um, even though this is the boundary of the picture, I'd have to remember that this Planck brain lives or th those degrees of freedom are part of my bulk theory. And that this is just, again, the entanglement wedge of the uh, of the boundary theory in particular in a particular configuration, and so again, I would use the standard rules of entanglement wedge reconstruction in this orbifold, and I would be reproducing, or I'd be able to tell you about what's going on in the interior of the black hole here using the boundary state. So I think all of these things, which seem somewhat mysterious at the beginning of the enterprise. It, it all becomes very clear with this higher dimensional uh, construction uh, that, that, you know, everything they said, all of the perhaps guesses they were making were in fact the correct uh, guess to make. Other questions, you know, uh, I, you know, was it important that we were working with these two dimensional models? Of course, the answer is no. Was the JT gravity important? Well, again, we were doing something where our brain theory uh, was a theory of Einstein gravity in higher dimensions. And so again, JT gravity was not so important. Was the ensemble averaging of the SYK model important? Again, I would say no, because our construction, it just uses the standard rules of ADS CFT and you're not averaging over any couplings in the boundary theory there. Um, another point is that in this paper from last fall, or, or actually, yeah, this one comes from last fall, they were distinguishing the full quantum description of the radiation from a semi-classical description of the radiation. Um, and, and in that, they also included purifying partners in the quantum extremal island. In the paper, they have a certain notation where sometimes regions are referred to or uh, with an ordinary uh, letter, and then in the in the other description, they're, they're using this bold face context. So, you know, do we see what? How would we translate that into our picture? Well, 
we had these three descriptions, uh, the boundary theory, the, you know, the purely bulk theory, and this sort of halfway where we had a brain and the boundary theory. Now, ADS-CFT, um, you know, I says that this and this are equivalent. And I would, I would say that those are the UV description or the UV complete description of the theory. And so that would be equivalent to their full quantum description of the radiation. And I have to emphasize that this boundary theory and this bulk theory, they're just equivalent. That's what the ADS CFT says, that I can use you know, this language or this language and I'll get all of the same answers. Now, this theory where I um, sort of did holography on the defect, but not on the rest of the brain theory, I'm using Randall Sundrum gravity. And one of the aspects I didn't emphasize before, but Randall Sundrum gravity actually naturally comes with a cutoff. And so we know that that's an effective theory. It, it describes the degrees of freedom um, correctly up to a certain energy scale. But beyond that, we have to rely. It's not that the physics goes crazy. It's just that the description we're using, say, with Einstein gravity on the brain, that breaks down and that's not a, an effect, a proper description of the physics and we have to go to some other uh, perspective. And so this is really the language, this is the language where I have a black hole in a gravitating region and a bath region without gravity. And so that's the, the description uh, that they, these folks described as the semi-classical description of the radiation and the Hawking partners. And so that's the framework that they were working with there. It's really this effective framework. And so it's clear, again, that this is an effective low energy description and that it doesn't capture all of the intricacies of the UV physics. So for instance, it couldn't explain, I couldn't explain from this perspective why the, uh, you know, the boundary theory was encoding information about the quantum extremal island. Now there's another interesting note that I'll just throw out to people because I don't know what to do with it. You know, we talked about the brain theory as being uh, a CFT with gravity, but it's really then in some sense an ensemble of CFTs that are being described on the CFT uh, on the brain here. And that's because, you know, the background metric on the brain or on this cutoff surface is just one source. If I'm doing ordinary ADS CFT, I, I can think of the metric as a source and the, that's the non-normalizable mode for the, the uh, bulk uh, geometry or the bulk metric. And the stress, the normalizable mode in that case is, of course, the stress energy tensor that's describing some properties of, uh, or something about the state or the excitations of the CFT. In our brain theory, we have a localized mode and uh, that, that describes this, this boundary theory. And I'm, because of the rules of ordinary path integrals or ordinary ADS CFT, I integrate over all of those boundary metrics. In principle, I do, and, th and that's the theory of gravity on the brain. But I could think about any other sources, for example, uh, you know, a scalar field that lives on uh, the bulk, that would have a normalizable and a non-normalizable mode. The non-normalizable modes, there would be an extra, you know, a new mode, a new normalizable mode associated with it on the brain and the standard rules would dictate that I integrate over that new field. And so I'd be integrating over that particular source for the boundary CFT. And so it seems then that the standard rules of ADS CFT are saying that when I think about this Randall Sundrum brain, I'm not thinking about a particular theory, but I'm thinking about averaging over all of the sources um, on that uh, particular brain. I have to emphasize though that that's different than what we're doing in the SYK theory. The SYK theory, there were couplings in the dual, in the boundary description, the quantum mechanics, and we were averaging over that. And so that was an average in the UV complete description. This is some kind of averaging that's appearing in the 
um, in the in the uh, semi classical in the in the brain perspective of the theory, and I just think that's interesting, and and we're thinking about it more. I'm not really fully sure what the implications of that are, um, but I I just think in the context where we're thinking about these ensemble Africans, um, it's interesting to think of R T or Randall syndrome gravity as a being some kind of averaging. Now the question, you know, was uh, one of the questions you might ask is how is the Hawking radi, you know, information really getting out? How is the Hawking radiation really encoding this information about the interior? Um, you know, uh, when the curve either here caps off or, or starts to decline here. What that's saying is that ultimately there are extra correlations between the late time Hawking radiation and the early time uh, Hawking radiation. Over here, I described it as you kind of fill up the register of the black hole and you start recycling the quanta. And that's why uh, there's this cap on the, inf uh, on the, uh, uh, the entropy here. In the late time phase. Um, so if, if we look instead, if we think about the growth phase, um, there, you know, Hawking started with the idea that the black hole has entropy. And how did he do that? Well, he looked at the Euclidean path integral. He looked at smooth semi-classical saddle points. And those calculations suggested that there's a black hole entropy. But the, we were only looking at smooth uh, saddle points. And so even though there was an entropy there, there was no information about the underlying microstates. And, and that's what gave rise ultimately to the information paradox. And so that's, that's what, well, that's what we're seeing in these growing phases, although now we think they only really apply in these red regions here. In the page phase here or here, what we're seeing is that, or what we expected was to really understand the unitarity, we're going to have to know all of the details of what are the microstates, how is the information encoded in the Hawking radiation. That was what we expected. But in fact, that expectation was wrong. The real surprise here is that the page phase or this decline gets described by another saddle point. In the context that I'm describing, it was another saddle point of an RT surface, but it, it doesn't describe or it doesn't reveal any secrets about the microscopic states of the black hole or the encoding of the Hawking radiation. And so that's really the surprise is that although we expected that you know resolving or understanding the page phase would require this detailed information in fact what we're finding is that there are just in the path integral some new saddle points and those saddle points you know control this uh gross behavior that we're seeing here but they don't really reveal anything about the details of the, the microscopic states. So a question you might ask is, well, you know, why didn't we expect um, something like this behavior where we didn't really need all of the microscopic details? You know, in fact, the page curve, this page curve is supposed to describe normal behavior of ordinary thermal systems. So why didn't we find this kind of behavior where there were different saddle points competing to describe different parts of this curve. And I think the answer is really that, well, we just didn't look very carefully. And that's emphasized in these papers. I mean, my collaborators and I did some similar work, but, but it's really already been published in, in these papers here. And this is an example where you look at an ordinary system and you see something like the behavior of the, the page curve, but you don't have to know, you don't have to worry about all of the details of the microscopic physics. And so the example is um, a two-dimensional CFT with a large central charge. 
And there's also a, a restriction on the sparsity of the spectrum. And what Tom Hartman showed is that by studying the conformal block expansion, there's a universal expression for or behavior in the entanglement entropies or the Rainy entropies for multiple intervals. And in fact, what you find uh, for two intervals in the complex plane, the entanglement entropy uh, looks like what well, looks like this in in uh, for one saddle, and it looks like this for, for the other. And so this is very much like the phase transition that we I talked about in the uh, holographic context, where you jump from one RT surface to another RT surface. In this context, it's just the way you organize the conformal block expansion and what dominates um, that expansion. Uh, that, that governs whether you're getting an answer that looks like this or it looks like that. And it, yeah, well, this is just saying a similar thing. It's a, it's a competition. You can think when there are rainy entropies that there are two intervals and there are four twist operators associated with the ends of those intervals. Um, and it's a competition in different OPE channels that give you this answer or this answer. Um, now, I set that aside for a moment, but I can think of uh, a correlator of two twist operators, not in the, in the plane, but in the half plane, um, where I have a conformal uh, boundary. And that gets translated into a four point function of these are, are, yeah, they're not holomorphic, but it gets translated to a holomorphic uh, correlation function in the pull plane. Um, and then I can use Hartman's analysis of that four point function. And what you find is that the entanglement entropy here for this particular problem, again, um, has this competition between saddles and there are two particular answers. One of the saddles involves the boundary and so in that particular case, there's an extra constant term or an extra normalization factor, which we can interpret in terms of the boundary entropy. Um, now, the, the trick is that I can take this particular construction here and do a conformal transformation to turn that into a periodic system where I'm talking about a thermal system now. And now what I'm going to do is look at a an entanglement entropy in a thermal bath. I'm essentially going to do the, the same calculation of looking at um, the uh, entanglement entropy of the radiation that's emitted uh, or of the radiation that it, uh, appears in this extended uh, bath region while it exchanges quanta with the, the defect in this little interval here. And what you find is that, again, Tom's analysis, there's a competition between these two saddle points. One of the saddles gives you the growth phase. One of the saddles gives you the page phase. The precise position of the transition depends on the boundary entropy. And so as you vary that, this curve moves up and down. But it's more or less the same behavior that you saw before. But in this particular case, again, it's a it's a completely, it's a quantum mechanical system. It's an ordinary system. There's no gravity involved. But what you're seeing is this kind of behavior arising because of the competition between two different saddles in the OPE um, uh, expansion. And so it's really, in this context, it's really not a gravity effect. Rather, it's just a large N effect um, that's producing this sharp transition between the two. So that's really all I wanted to say. I think there's an interesting model that we presented where we tried to demystify some of these new results. Um, you know, there's still a lot of questions that remain to be answered. You know, in particular, what or how much can we learn about the microstates and the encoding of the information in the Hawking radiation? There are lots of different directions in which one might uh, take this. And so I'll just end by saying, uh, there's lots to explore, and I'll thank you for your attention. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat>
So uh, please unmute uh, all of the participants and uh, make a give a clap for him for giving such a elaborative talk. And uh, thank you, Rob, for your detailed explanation. You're welcome. Uh, now you guys can ask the small questions because he's already tired. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Bit, yeah. Bob, I, I have a simple question now. The geometry you are describing like AD, uh, ADHD and then uh, the hyperbolic space, R cross HD minus 1, then you brought out some brain in that. Then the combined system is a solution of some gravity theory? Um, yeah. I mean, again, there, there are uh, ah, where is it? Somewhere there's a picture. There they are. So, so in this case, in you know, there's a gravity down here. It's the bulk gravity, and all I'm doing is I'm solving Einstein's equations in d plus one dimensions. Yeah. And there's a brain in there that back reacts. In no, this but, case, but do you have that brain as well as this uh, geometry as the solution of a Einstein theory? Here, yeah, what I tried to describe is what I'm building there is that's a solution of the d plus one, you know, dimensional uh, gravity coupled to a negative cosmological constant and a back reacting brain. The interesting thing. You have an exact brain solution there? Uh, the interesting thing I wanted to say, though, is that because of the Randall syndrome sort of nature of the problem, yeah. there's also an induced theory on the brain. This was that d dimensional theory way back at the beginning. Um, and I can also use that theory and solve for the equations of motion here. Yeah. Essentially, I'm in a regime where I get to ignore all of these higher curvature terms. And again, yeah. I'm, I'm solving Einstein's equations with a negative cosmological constant now in d dimensions yeah. and that tells me what the geometry of this brain is and it's again it's just an anti de sitter space with a new curvature scale and in one lower dimension but that's precisely the same geometry that you find from the bulk as the induced geometry on that brain I and so there's there are the, these three different descriptions two of them involve uh, gravity, there's gravity on the brain, the Randall Sundrum gravity here, and there's gravity, the full gravity in the bulk here, coupled to that brain. Is, is that so, answering the question or? It answers, it answers, but I believe that these brains are, uh, they are not charged with any gauge field because we That's don't right. have any gauge field yet. And in that case, the stability of the brains itself is a questionable right? question, right? Um, uh, yeah, the, there there are questions about stability, but in fact, you can you can people people have looked at the um, you know the entire. I mean, it's something. There actually, I should have mentioned a, a recent paper by Andreas Karch and his student. Um, where they're 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 referring this problem back to an older literature that he started with Lisa Randall, but um, people have looked at the entire spectrum of the graviton in this um, context, and what you find is that it is stable. Um, I, see. I, I mean that, that that's interesting for other reasons, but um, the stability is sort of a consequence of those calculations. I see. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other questions you guys have? I think a lot of people left because. Uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, if not, uh, uh, then. I, I, I still have one more. Um, okay. what, what's your idea? Is it possible to embed this geometry in a string theory or M theory context? Have you ever um, thought, have you thought about it? Um, I, well, again, I 
I haven't thought about it too much, but I know I gave a reference. I don't even know where it is now. Way back in section four, there's work that uh, uh, Karch, Andreas Karch and Lisa Randall did many years ago where they wanted to show that this construction, you know, in some sense, it's a bottom up construction in that I just stick a brain in there and I assign attention to it. But yeah. but they they argued that you get um, that construction um, by looking at the intersection of D three brains and D five brains in in string theory, and mm -hmm. then focusing in on the near horizon limit in the same way that you know if you just look at D three brains those solutions and you zoom in yeah. you get the ADS space. Yeah. Um, similarly, if you have this intersection, you find something that looks like the uh, construction that I had, where there's a brain running through the middle. Uh, I, I know Ofer Aronian collaborators have also looked at intersecting brains and come up with similar construction. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. There is a next uh, question, I think. Uh, hello, Professor Myers, hello. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. small question. Okay. Uh, so first of all, thank you for this amazing, beautiful talk. And uh, my question is perhaps the stupidest. Uh, so when you introduced the robots and uh, uh, so RS model, okay. Yeah. So uh, you talked about uh, uh, accent for the gravity in uh, for bulk and for the brain. So if I understand it correctly, so brain is the boundary of bulk. Is that it? Uh, yeah, you would. Uh, so in the way that I did it, um, I, I have a brain and it sits in the middle of the geometry. So I had a picture like this. This picture is a, is a cartoon of a cross section of the ADS space. So it's a time slice. Okay. And there's something, you know, locally the equations look you know, it's just a constant curvature space. So locally in these blue regions, it just looks like anti de Sitter space. The, the okay. greenish line is, uh, well, I'm gluing together those two regions and there's a jump. And so that brain is what, the brain is the green line and it's inducing this jump in the extrinsic curvature. And so in my construction, the brain is actually in the middle of the geometry okay but there's a symmetry between the two sides and so you could imagine doing a z2 orbifold and in that case what i would do is i would just throw away half of it and and in that case what i would have is a geometry that looks like this there'd be an asymptotic geometry here where i actually go to rho equals infinity but then over here, as you head out to large value, well, I guess this would be minus rho um, in these coordinates here. If you go out to here to, to large negative values of rho, eventually you can't quite go to infinity. You can go to some large value, but it would just be, uh, you would run into the brain at this point. And so in this sense, the brain would be at the edge of the geometry um, but it would really be at some finite distance, whereas the black line is really, that's the asymptotic, like that's an infinite distance away from some point in the middle here. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes. Thank, okay. thank you. Any more questions? Uh, someone unmuted. Joshua, you want to say something? Okay, I think no more questions. So uh, uh, thank you, Rob, for uh, giving such an uh, excellent talk and I will upload it uh, in YouTube and share the link with you. And uh, yeah, so have a, uh, so everybody have, have to save right now and uh, be safe, healthy, and uh, have a nice day. Okay, thank it's you. It's your much. daytime, I think. Yeah. Okay, take <laughs> care. You too, Santon. Yeah. Thanks. Bye bye.